Rocks and Stars and Dinosaurs, The Wonders of the World in Biblical Perspective. Lecture number three, Rocks, Gold, and Gems. The Bible has a lot to say about stones and rocks and a little bit less, but still a good deal more than we might expect to say about gems and gold and precious stones. These are emblems by God's creation design of his own greatness and glory. And perhaps the best place to start in looking at what the Bible has to say about rocks and gold and gems is to look at God, the rock of our salvation. And a key passage is Deuteronomy chapter 32, which might be called the Song of the Rock, though it's usually called the Song of Moses, because he wrote it. You may remember that when Israel came out of Egypt, they were led into the wilderness on their way to Canaan, and they became thirsty. There wasn't any water. And God provided water for them by telling Moses to strike a rock, and out of that rock came water. This, of course, was a picture of God's provision of water for them, and since the rock was the source, they could see God as their rock providing for them. There were rocks all around this wilderness area, and there were great walls of rock, particularly in the place where Moses stopped in Deuteronomy to give his last address. And having spoken to the people, last of all, Moses taught them this song, or oh, next to the last thing he did, he also prophesied with respect to the tribes in chapter 33. But Moses, toward the end of his days, taught them this song, and in the song, he celebrates God as the rock. Let's look at verses 3 and 4. I proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God, the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. In other words, God's constancy is like a rock. It doesn't change from day to day, from time to time. Then in verses 15 and 18, he reads, we read about uh, the apostasy of Israel. Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You are grown fat, thick, and sleek. Then he forsook God who made him and scorned the rock of his salvation. You neglected the rock who begot you. You forgot the God who gave you birth. And so God again is compared to a rock. And then in verses 30 and 31, How could one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight? unless their rock had sold them, and the Lord had given them up. Indeed, their rock is not like our rock. Even our enemies themselves can tell this. The gods of the other nations are like little rocks. There's not much to them. The Lord is their true rock. And if the God who is our rock gives us up, then we will be chased uh, by one man. One man will chase a thousand of us. And then in verse 37, uh, speaking of the wicked, God will say, Where are their gods, the rock in which they sought refuge? Speaking of the false gods. And so here, the Lord himself and also the false gods are spoken of as rocks, the foundations, the secure, stable, uh, faithful things upon which men depend. And the rocks of the nations are as nothing but pebbles, easily crushed to powder compared to God, the great rock, of history, the rock of ages. We may even remember that the law of God was written on tablets of stone, and we're used to thinking of how much better it is to have the law written on the tablets of our hearts, but let's not forget that writing the law on tablets of stones meant that it was constant and faithful, and meant that it was coming from God, the rock of their salvation. Well, not only is God manifest himself as the rock when Israel came out of Egypt, but throughout many other places in the Bible, he is spoken of and celebrated as the rock in song after song. The song of Hannah, for instance, in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in my God. There is no holy one like the Lord. There is no rock like our God. Or in David's song in 2 Samuel 22, verses 2 and following. O Lord, my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock of refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation. 
Here am I safe from my enemies, he says. Well, God there is the constant rock. And if you're hidden in rocks, then they can't get to you. You're secure. 2 Samuel 22 goes on in verse 32. Who is God except the Lord? Who is a rock except our God? Verse 47. The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. Extolled be my God, the rock of my salvation. A concordance study would show many more, especially in the Psalms. Psalm 17. I love you, Lord, my strength, my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. My God is the rock where I take refuge, my shield, my mighty help. In verse 32, who is God but the Lord, who is a rock but our God? Psalm 94, verse 1, come, ring out our joy to the Lord, hail the rock who saves us. Psalm 18, verse 15, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Psalm 27, verse 1, to you, O Lord, I call my rock, hear me. Psalm 41, I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go in mourning oppressed by the foe? And on and on it goes. Psalm 30, be a rock of refuge for me, a mighty stronghold to save me, for you are my rock, my stronghold. The Bible over and over calls God our rock. And in Isaiah he's called the rock numerous times. Isaiah 17, verse 10. You have forgotten God, your Savior, and remembered not the rock, your strength. Isaiah 26, verses, verse 4. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord is an eternal rock. And so, many times in the Bible, God is called a rock. Now, we can summarize what the Bible has to say about God as our rock uh, by taking five angles on it. First of all, the rock points to strength. Strength. A rock is firm and hard and strong. And if it's a large rock, it's unbreakable. This was before the days of dynamite. You just didn't go break up a gigantic rock. And the Lord was called a rock because of his strength. Secondly, God reveals himself as a rock, as a fortress to hide in. Caves in the rocks, hidden in the rocks. Moses was hidden in the cleft in the rock when God passed his glory by him so that Moses might not be consumed. Hidden in a rock. A third angle on God as a rock is that it points to judgment. If God is a rock for us, then our enemies will be crushed beneath him. If a rock falls on you, then you are crushed. In fact, in the book of Revelation, the wicked pray to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the wrath of him who is to come. And so, we can trust in God, our rock, to stone our enemies. And in fact, of course, in the Bible, the prescribed method of execution was by stoning. Now, we don't know a great deal about how stoning was done in the Bible uh, in In the case of Stephen, they picked up stones and stoned him. We get the impression that he was a man being pelted by rocks thrown by other people until he was killed. Um, There is evidence to suggest that stoning was usually done by taking somebody up to a high place and casting them down and then rolling a, a large stone onto them so that they were crushed and killed all at once. And then all the members of the community would walk by and toss a little rock upon the pile so that there was a mound of rocks. And in years to come, this would be a memorial, a reminder that so-and-so died here for committing such-and-such a crime. Uh, This man committed adultery, and he was stoned to death. And all the community joined in agreement with the fact that he should be put to death, and each of us threw a stone on here. And now there's this mound of stones to remind us not to commit the same sin. That seems to have been the method. And what's interesting is the idea that, first of all, a large rock was dropped on a person to kill him all at once. And that would be a picture of God the rock bringing judgment upon those who have defiled him or upon his enemies. And then the little rocks were tossed by the members of the community, giving their amen to the judgment that had been pronounced. But whether that was the method or not of stoning, 
the fact is that the rock uh, speaks of judgment. It speaks of judgment. It speaks of strength. It's a fortress for the righteous to hide in, and it's a rock of judgment that falls upon the wicked. The rock also speaks of a firm foundation. If it's on the ground, you can build on it. A very familiar passage tells us this. Matthew chapter 7, verse 34 and 35, uh, 24 and 25. Everyone who hears these words of mine, says Jesus, and acts upon them, may be compared to a wise man who built his house upon the rock. What rock? Well, you see, if you know the Old Testament now, it's not just any rock. It's God himself. The rain descended and the floods came, and the wind blew and burst against the house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded upon the rock. Finally, uh, the rock gives shade. If you're in a hot day and you come upon some uh, tall rock standing out of the ground, it would be common in that part of the world. We're not used to that here. We would get shade under trees normally, but it's also possible to find shade under a mighty rock. Uh, the shadow of a mighty rock within a weary land, says the hymn. And that's based on passages in Isaiah. And of course that shows us that a large rock... Uh, which happens to be shaped like a cloud, reminds us of the glory cloud of God. Because just as the cloud overshadowed the people and kept them cool and from the heat and hid them from uh, their enemies, so the shade of a mighty rock will keep us cool in the heat and protect us from our enemies. So these are the associations that we ought to have when we think about Jesus Christ the rock. Uh, and the Lord our rock. And when we go outside and we see stones, we can remember that we are like those living stones built into a house, as Peter says. And we can remember that Jesus Christ is the great rock, uh, a rock that's unstoppable, firm, strong, a fortress to hide in, one who judges the wicked, a firm foundation and a shade from tribulation and difficulty. Now, as I mentioned, the Bible uh, speaks of God's people as little rocks. If God is the rock, then those who are in the image of God and who are like God and who are righteous and firm, then we are little rocks. And that's no surprise because we're the image of God. So if God is like the sun, then we are like the stars. And if God is like a great rock, then we are like little rocks. Isaiah chapter 32 speaks of how Christians minister one to another as rocks. Each will be a refuge from the wind. This is verse 2 of Isaiah 32. Each will be like a refuge from the wind and a shelter from the storm, like streams of water in a dry country, like the shade of a heavy rock in a parched land. Each of us will be that way to the other, says Isaiah, giving shade one to another, giving protection one to another like a rock just as the Lord, the great rock, gives shade and protection to us. The most famous passage along these lines, however, and unfortunately one that's much disputed, is Matthew 16. Matthew 16, and we can start reading in verse 13. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, saying, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some, John the Baptist. Some, Elijah. Some, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Anointed One, the Son of the Living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonas, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, a rock. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not overpower it. Now, as Protestants, we don't believe that Peter is the rock on which the church is built. 
and that is apparent in the Greek. Uh, the t- stones are the words are different here. Petros is a stone, and Petra, the rock on which the church is built, is a large rock or bedrock. It's helpful to us, although it's not absolutely necessary to understand the text, to realize where Caesarea Philippi is. It's the headwaters of the Jordan River, and the Jordan River flows out, believe it or not, from a great big huge rock. There's a huge wall of rock there, and that's where the Jordan takes its rise in that part of the country. That reminds us, of course, of the rock in the wilderness and the water that flowed from it. And it's in the presence of this great big huge rock that water flows from that Jesus says, Upon the rock I will build my church. Now, if we're familiar with biblical imagery and symbolism, then all of this becomes very pregnant to us. The church, which is built on the living spiritual water that flows from Jesus Christ, the rock who was struck uh, on our behalf. And that's where it's built. And Peter is like a little rock. He is cut from the big rock. He is in the image of the big rock. And out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water just as the mighty torrents of water, spiritual water, flow from the mighty rock, Jesus Christ. And so the Bible not only shows us God as the rock, but also God's people as little rocks. Now that's something we should bear in mind when we go into the world and we dig in the ground and we find stones and rocks. God told the people of Israel that the land that he was giving them had stones like iron. They could build with them. And if you go to Israel, if you are fortunate enough ever to get to go before they tear it all up over there, then you would see walls of rocks everywhere. You clear a field, you just get out plenty of rocks and you build walls with them around your field to mark out your property. The land was full of rocks. And as they encountered those rocks, they would remember God their rock and they would remember they themselves as living stones being built up into the kingdom of God. Now let's turn our attention from the rock as a strength, rock as a foundation, uh, rock as a judgment that falls upon the wicked, rock as a shade, to a consideration of precious stones. Precious stones, gold and silver and jewels. Uh, Anywhere you go, you'll find coffee table books with pictures of beautiful gemstones, quartz crystals, emeralds, rubies, topaz, and many others, pictured in full color. Children love to see these things, and so do adults. We don't very often get to see them in real life, maybe in a museum. Maybe some wealthy person that we know might have a number of different kinds of stones uh, that we could look at. Usually we see a diamond here or there on the engagement ring, Maybe a few other gemstones, relatively small. Not much, but in a coffee table book we can see nice, big, beautiful things out of museums and feast our eyes on them. And they're beautiful to look at and they're attractive and people want them. Why do people want diamonds? Why do people want rubies? It's only because they're attracted to them they find them beautiful. They're precious. They don't have any particular economic worth. There are plenty of industrial diamonds around. It's because of their beauty. Men prize them for their beauty. And um, the Bible shows us this right from the Garden of Eden to the New Jerusalem. If we look back at the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 2, we see that right at the outset... Beautiful stones are associated with the world that then was. Now, not actually, it's not actually told us here that these stones were in the Garden of Eden. Uh, we look at verse 10. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. From there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon. It flows around the whole land of Havilah, which is Arabia, where there is gold, The gold of that land is good. We'll have to see what that might mean. The bdellium and the onyx stone are there. Now we're not told that these stones were in Eden, but we are told that they were there uh, in association with Eden. The river that flowed out of Eden went to a land called Havilah where these things were. 
Now, in Ezekiel chapter 28, we read this. Verse 13. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The ruby, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the lapis lazuli, the turquoise, and the emerald, and the gold. Now, the next verse says, You walked in the midst of stones of fire. And from this passage we see that while there may have been gold and onyx and bdellium and havilah, there were clearly some gold and there was also lots of precious gems in Eden itself available to hand. Um, we have to assume that if they were there for Adam to see on the one day that he got to spend in the garden before he fell and was cast out, then they weren't buried in the ground and didn't have to be dug out and refined. They were on the surface. Uh, gold, which uh, does not have to be smelted out but is just in lumps, is called native gold. And apparently there was native gold there. And Adam could have uh, robed himself in these things. They were there as available to be part of his garments and the garments of his bride. They were all there in the Garden of Eden. A beautiful place indeed with its trees and its tame animals, its colors, and now we see that it had all these beautiful stones also right there to look at, to pick up, to work with. Now, that's not to say that there wasn't more gold and other things buried in the ground. Uh, God, I'm sure, intended for men to grow and develop and to learn smelting techniques and refining techniques. And so uh, I'm sure that gold mixed with impurities, what we call impurities, was also there. But there was also native gold and native or uh, precious gems available to see right there on the ground or in the rocks. So... That's what Eden was like. And uh, when we read about these things in the Bible, they should remind us of the Garden of Eden when we see them in the world. Now, they are called in Ezekiel 28.14 stones of fire. I used to think when I'd read that passage that we had rocks on the ground that had flames coming out of them, but that's not the meaning. If you have an engagement ring... Ladies might be listening to this, or you can imagine men, any stone that is a diamond or anything else, hold it up and look at it, and you'll see fire inside. This is the sparkling, uh, iridescent shining of, that comes from the inside of the stone, crystalline stone, that makes it a stone of fire. And since fire is associated with the glory of God, we can see that it's as if a piece of frozen glory is there before us. Glory encased in this crystalline form. And if men are naturally drawn and attractive, attracted to the beauty of God, even fallen men are, although they try to use it for their own purposes, but men are attracted to the glory of God, then they're attracted to the glory as it is shown frozen and encased in beautiful jewels. So here all these things were, stones of fire, stones that have fire in their heart, as well as gold and onyx and bdellium. Now before we look at the gemstones and their meaning in the Bible, let's look at these other things, onyx and bdellium and gold. First of all, let's consider the onyx stone that's mentioned here in Genesis. We don't know absolutely for sure if this onyx is the same as our modern onyx, but it probably is. The Bible doesn't say much about it. But the one thing that is interesting is that the high priest of Israel was told to wear onyx stones on his shoulders. We find out about this in Exodus 25, verse 7, and Exodus 28, 9 through 12. The high priest was to wear two onyx stones, and the names of the twelve tribes were written on them. Now, remember that onyx in Genesis 2 is said to be from the land of Havilah, and it was actually the land of Havilah that Israel was living in while the tabernacle and the high priest's garments were made. It's what today is Saudi Arabia, when they came out of Egypt on their way to the promised land. What's curious about the 
onyx stones that the high priest was to wear on his garments, on his shoulders, is that they were said to be stones of memorial. What were they memorializing? A memorial of what? Well, the only other thing in the Bible is the Garden of Eden. And I think that probably they were to remind the people of the blessings of the Garden of Eden and the blessings that Adam had <clears throat> and was to increase in and grow in had he not fallen. The high priest not only had these onyx stones on his shoulder, he also had the stones of fire on his breastplate. And remember we saw that Adam is said in Ezekiel chapter 28 to have been there in the garden of God with the stones of fire that were available as his dress, as his covering. And here the high priest is actually dressed in them, an emblem of what Adam should have been and what Jesus Christ would be and what we will be in him. So there's the onyx stone showing up later in the Bible and specifically called a memorial, probably a memorial of the Edenic blessings. And when we see the onyx stone, we should remember the Garden of Eden and the land of Havilah and the promise that these things will be given to us again. Even more curious is this mineral called bdellium. Nobody knows what this is. Actually, that's just the Hebrew word there written over into English, bdellium. It only occurs one other time in the Bible, and uh, that's in Numbers chapter 11, verse 7, where we read that the manna was the same color as bdellium. Now, since manna was probably white, and in fact we know that manna was white from Exodus 16, verse 31, then the bdellium was a white stone. The manna in the wilderness, why, why do you suppose God would say the manna was the color of bdellium? The only thing that we can think of is, again, to think back to the original creation, the Garden of Eden, the land of Havilah, and of course they were in the land of Havilah when they were eating that manna. That's the only thing we can think back of. And so the provision of manna, this bread, was a daily reminder to them that they were being restored to the Garden of Eden. That God was giving them back into a spacious, gracious land flowing with milk and honey that would be like the Garden of Eden. And as they traveled through Havilah on their way to Canaan, they could think we were traveling through Havilah, the land of Bedellium and Onyx, on our way to Eden, the land of gold, silver, and jewels. Well, such are onyx and bdellium. Gold, of course, we don't have as much trouble with. We know what gold is. Gold is very valuable today and much in the news. I think there are two things in particular that we should think about just for a minute in terms of gold and silver and their value. They, more than any other minerals, uh, metals, show forth the glory of God. And why this is so has to do with the way the universe was designed and man's psychology was designed. But it is true, in every culture of the world, in every time and in every season, these minerals are the ones that become valuable. And the Bible tells us that they're valuable from beginning to end. And they're valuable not because they have any intrinsic value, because nothing has intrinsic value, everything is created. They have value to the extent that they reveal and reflect the glory of God. There are two things we might point to here. One is that they're heavy. Gold is particularly heavy. I remember the first time I ever held a gold coin, I was amazed at how heavy it was, because we're used to... Uh, other kinds of coins that are not anywhere near as heavy. And the word that the Hebrew word kavod, which is translated glory, also means heavy. Um, C.S. Lewis wrote a book called The Weight of Glory. And glory is heaviness in the Bible. In fact, in American slang a few years back, uh, people said things were heavy. Oh, wow, man, that's really heavy. And uh, that comes out of the depth psychology of human nature to refer to grand things or impressive things as heavy. And so things that are grand or impressive or glorious are heavy. And the glory of God is heavy and gold is heavy. And uh, anything that's heavy is impressive. Not only, is, not only is gold heavy, it's also radiant. 
or shiny. Hebrews 12.29 tells us that our God is a consuming fire. And as we've seen, His glory cloud appears as flashing fire and a glowing furnace. And the beauty of the sun and of the sunrise and of the sunset all connect up to that glorious appearance of God. And gold, apparently more than any other mineral, ties in to the human natural human tendency to appreciate and value glory. Gold doesn't tarnish, it doesn't corrode ordinarily, and uh, it more than any other mineral shows that permanence and constancy, the heaviness, and the color and radiance that we most associate with glory. And so when we see gold or see a golden object, we ought, we ought not to think only in terms of its value as an investment or its beauty as an object of art even, but appreciate the gold itself as an emblem, as a token of God's glory, and as a reminder of his strength and heaviness and beauty. Well, that's gold, bdellium, and onyx stone. And now finally, and in conclusion, we come to the gemstones in the Bible. In your notebook you have a chart that gives uh, some idea uh, of what the colors and possibly the stones are that are listed in Ezekiel, Exodus, and Revelation. Well, many of the terms there we don't know exactly how to translate. We aren't sure of the colors of each one. We aren't sure of what the stones are in every case. Uh, hopefully as the decades go by and more research is put into this, more studies of ancient literature, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we will be able to make more accurate translation. But as it stands, you can take out a crayon and color in the chart uh, to get some idea, perhaps, of what the breastplate of the high priest looked like or photocopy that page and let your children color it. God's people are said to be precious stones to him, referring to gemstones. This is given us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 10. Paul says, According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another, the pastor of the church here, is building upon it. Let each man be careful how he builds upon it, for no man can lay a foundation other than the one that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds upon the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, or costly stones, those are your gemstones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire. The fire will test the quality of each man's work. Now, what's being spoken of here are not good works in the abstract, but people. Paul is talking about building the church. He's talking about his role as an apostle and the pastor's role in building the church. And the gold, silver, and precious stones are people. And the wood, hay, and stubble are also people. <clears throat> and churches get both kinds in them. And sometimes the wood, hay, and stubble catches on fire and is burned up out of the church uh, through gossip and lies. And these things only refine the faith of the gold, silver, and precious stone by burning off their dross. Be that as it may, the fact is God's people here are compared to gold, silver, and gemstones. And similarly, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, Peter says, You also, as living stones, are built up as a spiritual house. We are stones that are being built into a house. Now, we might think they are bricks or regular stones, and that's possible. But when we look over at the book of Revelation, we will find that gemstones are the stones that actually are being used to build the house. Now, before we can really understand the picture that we get in Revelation chapter 21 of these gemstones on the wall of the city, we need to drop back and think about the rainbow. The rainbow is one of the manifestations of God's glory. It has all the colors in it. It appears in the heavens. But in the Bible, it's also pictured as appearing around the throne of God. Remember when the rainbow first appeared, or is given a particular meaning, perhaps it had appeared before, 
but God assigns it a particular meaning in Genesis chapter 9 verse 13 I will set my war bow in the cloud and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth and it will come about when I bring a cloud over the earth the bow will be seen in the cloud now that has a double meaning because when we get inside the glory cloud of God we see the rainbow there and then natural clouds and rain phenomena also bring about a natural rainbow and God says I will see the rainbow and I will remember my covenant when the bow is in the cloud I will look upon it to remember the everlasting covenant you see if we look at it and remember the covenant that God has made with us that's great and we should but that won't save us God needs to look at it and remember the covenant that he has made with us and of course God is in no danger of forgetting but as a sign to us he puts his war bow in the cloud and says I will look at it and I will remember it I will remember that I have promised salvation to you and not judgment well does God always see this rainbow or does it only appear from time to time and then he forgets about it no it's always there we may not see it but God always sees it in Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 28 uh, we read that when the glory appeared as the appearance of the rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day so is the appearance of the surrounding radiance now that's important that means that there is a rainbow a circular rainbow going all the way around the throne of God so that whichever way God looks as he looks out into the world he looks through the rainbow and he is always reminded to keep the peace that he established after the flood and he will never again bring a flood upon the earth God doesn't need this of course but he has chosen to do it this way to teach us and we must benefit from it there is a rainbow all around the throne of God it circles the throne similarly in Revelation chapter 4 when John goes up inside the glory Revelation 4 verse 3 he who was sitting was like a jasper throne and a sardius in appearance that's red and there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance the green was apparently highlighted but there was a rainbow around the throne in a circle and then in Revelation chapter 10 the uh, Jesus Christ who is pictured here as an, a strong angel but we know that he's Christ by the description of him he comes out of heaven clothed with a cloud there's the Lord and a rainbow around his head his face like the sun and his legs like pillars of fire well there's no doubt about who this is but the rainbow is around his head it circles his head there again he has to look through it uh, to see the world and so he will always be reminded of the covenant he made to preserve the world and to bless his people well if there is a rainbow circling the throne of God then when we get to the walls of Jerusalem in Revelation chapter 21 and we see that this new Jerusalem is where the throne of God is and the Lamb and there is a river of water of life flowing out from the throne of God and of the Lamb right in the center of the city and we come out to the boundaries of the city and the walls we find these colored stones all around it Revelation 21, 19 and 20 foundation stones of the city were adorned with every kind of precious stone the first foundation stone was adorned with jasper the second sapphire the third chalcedony the fourth emerald the fifth sardonyx the sixth sardius the seventh chrysolite the eighth beryl the ninth topaz the tenth chrysophrase the eleventh jacinth and the twelfth amethyst and the twelve gates were twelve pearls each of the gates was a single pearl the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass well we're not exaggerating I think to say that this is a frozen rainbow the rainbow that we've seen in the form of water droplets or water vapor around the throne of God now takes the form of frozen solid gemstones of all colors circling the city these things correspond one to another and we will see this same pattern uh, 
In the next tape, when we look at plants, we'll see that plants uh, adorning the walls and on all the walls of the temple are like the host of God arraigned around his throne. And here, the stones that we are being built up into God's house are being arranged around God's throne. Remember, we are like the stars of the heavenly host arrayed around God's throne. And as we'll see, we are like the trees in the Garden of Eden arrayed around God's throne. And here, we are like the living stones that are forming the walls of the temple, the walls of the city of Jerusalem arrayed around the throne of God. And God doesn't want ugly brown rocks around his throne. He wants beautiful gemstones of all different colors and sparkling hues. And that's us. We are the ones who are arrayed around his throne. We are the rainbow when all is said and done. The same image is given of either way. It's not just in Revelation, but it's also in Isaiah 54, verses 11 and 12. O afflicted, storm-tossed, and not comforted one, behold, I will set your stones in cosmetic paste, and your foundations I will lay in sapphires. I will make your battlements of rubies, and your gates of crystal, and your entire wall of precious stones. There's the promise that God would rebuild Jerusalem and put all these beautiful stones in her. Now, it may be true that there will come a time in the future when men are so honest that we can actually take precious stones and set them on the walls of our public buildings and put them in cosmetic paste so that they could easily be plucked out. But nobody will pluck them out because everyone is so honest and everyone prefers to have them there. That day may come. We're not living then today. But symbolically, we are. As we stand around the throne of God, we are those glorious stones. So what are these gems of fire, these stones of fire? Well, they're just little frozen chips of the rainbow filled with light and color and lying on the ground for us to see. And I hope that as you pick up your coffee table book of beautiful stones or as you admire them when you check them out of the library and as your children see these things, will be reminded, you will be reminded, they'll be reminded of the rainbow of God and of His glory and that these stones are little emblems of what it means to be a Christian. Finally, connecting these gemstones to the rainbow enables us to draw three uh, inferences. And I've pointed to them now uh, let me summarize them together in three points. First of all, first of all, according to Ezekiel 28 verse 13, these stones were raw material in the Garden of Eden. And so they remind us of the Garden of Eden and they show us that the human race as a disorganized group of people are like diamonds in the rough, like gemstones in the rough that need to be organized and uh, arrayed in a host around God's throne. They were there waiting to be used in Eden. So first of all, the stones and human beings were raw material in the Garden of Eden. Second thing they point us to is taken from Revelation 21, verses 19 and 20, where we see the stones arrayed around the throne of God. And that shows that it's the destiny of the human race or the redeemed portion of the human race to be glorified beautified and arrayed around God's throne as a human rainbow in order in his presence. An additional aspect of this, if we are the rainbow, then we are God's war bow. And that makes sense as well because the host that's arrayed around God's throne is his army. This is pictured for us, of course, in the book of Numbers, where the people are organized as an army and they are encamped in a great square around the tabernacle itself. And here, the rainbow, God's war bow, is associated with his people. We implement this covenant that he has made, bringing not war, but peace to the world as warriors for the Prince of Peace. 
We are the frozen rainbow, the living stones that bring the message of God's warfare, which is his summons to peace with him. And so we are God's warriors and his war bow, his rainbow, arrayed around his throne. And finally, from Exodus chapter 28, verses 17 to 20, we find that these stones represent the twelve tribes of Israel, and so once again represent God's people. And they're placed upon the breastplate of the clothing of the high priest, who is adamically and Christically arrayed in glory and they're put on this breastplate over his heart and so we read in verse 29 of Exodus 28 Aaron shall carry the names of the sons of Israel in the breast piece of judgment over his heart when he enters the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually and uh, this tells us that Jesus Christ our great high priest carries us on his heart We are always there. We're not only a host arrayed around his throne, but we are also at the center, right next to his heart. And he carries us on his heart. And no matter what difficulties and tribulations we may be going through, and even if we feel like an ugly brown piece of crumbling granite rock and not like a gemstone, the fact is we are on his heart and we are carried there by him whenever he goes into the Father's presence. And since he's always in the Father's presence, We are always there with him, there on the breast piece of judgment next to his heart. We have been accepted. Judgment has been passed on our favor. And there we are on the heart of God. Well, that scratches the surface of what the Bible has to say about rocks and gold and precious stones. This is the end of our third lecture in our series, Rocks and Stars and Dinosaurs.